Hi, I'm David Velasco. I'm the editor-in-chief of Art Forum, and I'm here today with Hannah Bear, who is the cover star and cover writer of the summer issue. So thank you for being with us today. I know, it's such a treat. Thank you for inviting me. It's so nice to be in this particular beautiful place on this gorgeous day. And you can hear a little bit of pride in the background. I actually wonder if there will probably be interruptions from cars going by or I'm very happy there's not a drum circle at this moment. There's so many things I want to talk to you about. Your book, Trans Girl Suicide Museum, which I love. Um, the way that I've been able to see threads between what you wrote there and what you've done in other writings and the thing you wrote for us. But maybe I'd like to start with uh, the cover and how that came about. Definitely. So. Uh, there's this friend, Blaine O'Neill, who lives in Los Angeles and is like a, someone I've known for many years, but is someone who I got kind of into an intense correspondence with around the AI stuff. And then he sent me a link to a website that was like a deep fake generator. So it was like, you can, and it was, it was a porn website. It was, the premise was you can see any girl naked. So you put in a picture of like, a celebrity or more creepily like someone you know and you, it would generate the same image of the person ostensibly a woman um just a gestational person who knows you call it what you want uh without her clothes on and given access to this technology of course my first impulse was to put in a picture of myself and when the image was produced, which I didn't understand when I started, but I put the image in and then it gave me back this picture of me, this sort of like disembodied picture of me naked, but it was blurred and it was like, you have to pay $30 to unblur the image. And that was like the, that's the genesis of that image, which is like, oh, do I pay money to see my own AI generated naked body? Which I actually decided not to do. So the high-res version does not exist in the world? Not yet, though. In the process of doing this, I went back to the website and like was like, should I remake the image? I thought I like had a Pandora's box moment of being like, should I pay the $30? And then I still didn't do it. So there's no, um, there's no version without the blur that I've made, though both images are in the world, so someone could do it if they wanted to, I guess, which is also part of what's I think it makes people a little uncomfortable about the technology. It's about who gets to own the stuff it generates, you know, and who gets to make money from it. I would love to hear if there's, um, you know, if there's something about the confessional tone of something like Trans Girl Suicide Museum that you see is related to what you're doing on the cover, um, or if you think it's different, like these different levels of exposure, basically, and how they make you feel and if you feel like there's a different aim for them. Well, it's political in this moment to put a picture of me with like a, like AI drawn bottom surgery, post bottom surgery, whatever, on a cover of a magazine. In this moment where people are, we're sort of like a couple notches or clicks on the dial away from being like trans people need to really disappear, you know? Um, and I think that that anxiety is connected to these kinds of fears about transformation. Or there's this Charlie Kirk, this very conservative political commentary uh, guy, whatever, right-wing jerk, who uh, at some point is like, there's some interview where he's like, if people can just change their gender, if a man can just say, no, actually, I'm a woman, then plausibly a poor person could just say, actually, I'm rich. And he's like, and that's why it's threatening. Because if people can autonomously self-define and the systems that we've locked ourselves into aren't actually confining us, power will shift in a way that we, we and he's talking about conservatives and about this kind of conservative tradition of white masculine people getting to hold power. He's like, that isn't what we want. We don't want that to shift, you know? And I think there's like, Engaging with that relationally and engaging with like the fear around it in a real way is interesting, right? Like it's, people's fear about AI is interesting. People's fears about losing their power, about being dominated, about being abused, like that's a, those are real fears. And I think that um, 
also the things that people justify doing because of those fears are really atrocious. So it's like, that's another piece of the, the AI stuff and the cover and this, this moment around like what technology has actually enabled trans people to do with their bodies in this time that is like pretty plausibly pretty destabilizing to the history of patriarchy. Um, and that we're kind of going to war with culturally right now, you know? I talk about this some in the book, but it's as someone who like was brought up by academics and like went to fancy high school and fancy college, I got really trained to talk about my thinking from a critical remove. So to be like, oh, well, to like have a conversation like this one being like, oh, well, like there's like these different aesthetic modes about like how you would like discursively produce or disseminate knowledge instead of being like, it feels really good to me to say my ideas in connection with the exact feeling I was having when they came into my mind. And so I think for me, part of also making a work about like that my own feminization and my own like transition was also about making a work that was about like really being in my body, really being in my experience. One of the things, I mean, there's a lot of things that your article actually discusses that are, um, I mean, that I would love to talk about. One of them is this idea of self-enhancement versus self-transcendence, which is related to this question of intelligence that you've been, I know you've been working on for some time. Right, right. And when you, you know, you look at the history of like when people made up intelligence tests, that's like the beginning of, it wasn't the beginning of, but it's like there's this, when people were like, oh, we can discreetly measure that certain people are less intelligent then we can also justify abusing them. Um, and that pull is connected to the, the thing you brought up about self-enhancement values, which are like values. And so the self-enhancement, self-transcendence stuff comes from the psychologist Shalom Schwartz, who came up with this idea that I, he thinks is universal. And there's a lot of debate about the universality and what that me really means. But he was kind of like in cultures across the world, these values tend to show up and they tend to be opposed to each other to some extent. And so self-enhancement values are values around like getting more power, making yourself bigger, getting like more resources, having more control, having more authority. And then self-transcendence values are values about like wisdom, benevolence, communalism. There's a ton of people who have researched this in different ways, but one of the kind of important ideas for me is that these things are pretty hard to hold at the same time. So if you're trying to be the smartest person in the room, you're, it's less likely then that you're also thinking, asking these more process-oriented, more relational questions, like how is everyone doing in the room? What does everyone need? How could we learn the most together, have the best possible experience? Um, and so in a culture where we train people in schools to be like, who's the smartest person in the room? How can you be as smart as possible? Of course, yeah, we make an AI and we're like, oh, that, it's gonna be the smartest person in the room and it's gonna make us all look bad and or like dominate and abuse us because that's what we believe intelligent beings do. You mentioned earlier, I mean, that you've gone to grad school for psychology and as somebody who uh, writes regularly, um, who has, uh, I guess this, this life as a writer, um, I was curious what motivated you to, to become a therapist or to do psychology as a profession? I tell people that I was like a barista before I was a ther in therapy school, but I, another thing I was also doing was working as an organizational consultant. And I was closeted, so I was like appearing in these organizations and like leading trainings and stuff, being read as a cis man. And there was something about that that I needed to like get rid of. But I still wanted to keep doing that, ver some version of like trans transformative work and I had this idea that the kind of role of the therapist would enable me to have more kind of flexibility and privacy in some ways about as my body changed and as my kind of persona changed so that's like the kind of real answer about it was that I was like I want to keep doing healing work I want to keep trying to change the world because it's fucked up and because we all need to be asking that question collectively and personally but I can't go into like boardrooms of nonprofit executives anymore and be like, I'm a charismatic guy and here's my clever idea. Um, and I was like, okay, well then what healing work could you do that would be safer in some ways? And that would also fit the, this changing feeling I was having about myself of being like, 
no, I don't want to relate to the world abstractly through ide disembodied ideas. I want to relate to the world in this embodied way, and I want to relate to the world um, through like emotions and subjectivity. And that was kind of like, then I was like, I think you can do that in certain, not all kinds, but in certain kinds of psychotherapy. Do you ever feel like your work in psychotherapy is in uh, conflict with your work as a writer or in tension? I mean, or is that tension productive for you if there is one? I think there's part of my life as a therapist where I'm not, you know, whatever my kind of political beliefs about that neutral stance are, like I don't, not all of my patients know that I'm trans. Not all of my patients know the gender, sexuality of the people I have sex with. My patients certainly don't know that I spend a lot of time in nightclubs or that like um, when I'm not at work, sometimes I like to stay up all night with my friends. You know, there's these different parts of my life that just aren't in the therapy room. And writing is a space where I get to do that. So when I write an article, and this is something that's been fun about writing for, for you, writing for our forum, has been like, I get to be like in my piece about AI or my piece about nightlife or what have you to say like, I had this ex particular experience and this is what it meant to me. I mean, it's interesting to hear, first of all, you know, one of the first things you wrote for me was about uh, nightlife culture. One of the things that I think about in relationship to that is a book by uh, a good friend of mine, Douglas Crimp, who died some years ago. And he wrote a book called Before Pictures. It was a memoir of his time before he made this show, Pictures, which uh, was one of the early articulations of postmodernism in art. And Before Pictures talks about his struggle as a young gay man in New York trying to find this balance between the work he was doing professionally or, you know, in, in school, actually, um, with his desire to be a part of gay nightlife. Um, and so, to me, that tension, actually, his inability to reconcile uh, his desire to fit into nightlife and his desire to be, uh, you know, a, a supreme academic um, is what gave his work such life. It's what gave his writing such um, intensity. So I tend to think that the uh, having a contradiction that you can't resolve inside some sort of tension, having these uh, ambivalences is, uh, is actually a very important part of creativity. It's an important part of um, making work that feels alive in the world. Well, it's interesting, right, because in nightlife, I mean, nightlife has the problem that all subculture stuff has, which is that it gets kind of like assimilated into the mainstream, you know? So like anything that's cool mainstream was like probably at some point was cool not mainstream and then it gets like reuptaked into this system of commodification. And I think that that's a really complicated part. It's connected to something we were just speaking about earlier today, but it's a complicated part about writing about anything subaltern is being like once you turn over the rock and show it to the light of day, like the microorganisms that, you know, like then it stops being what it is. I've relaxed my anxiety around that enough to give myself permission to write about kind of like underground dance music culture a little bit um, in a way that probably would have been really anathema to me when I was younger and kind of more principled about being like, no, like no one should see it. It's like if it's if it's secret, it's secret in this certain way. Um, and I think there's something that's also like, there's a part of, there's a quote in this book about like, from Foucault about like this question about like, what's the deal with drugs? And he's like, there's a, basically like, it's the question of like what drugs are and what they do is like not an insignificant part of this question of capitalism because they really fuck with certain parts of like, ideas about like rationality and like linear time and like all this other, you know, there's something really destabilizing about them. And not that dance music culture and drugs are like the same thing, but I think my experience of those spaces, and especially in the past few years as I've experimented more with being sober in those spaces and being like, what does it mean to not use drugs as I'm also like pushing my body to stay up all night, pushing my body to dance for many hours, spending a really connective time with people who are using a lot of drugs. It's been interesting to be like, oh yeah, like how do these spaces like push up against the bounds of what people are allowed to do, how, what people, how people feel like they're allowed to relate to each other. Um, and kind of connecting back to this idea about like self-enhancement requiring this imaginative work, having to imagine what the world would be like if it was different. I feel like I 
there's kind of like glimmers or like kind of through the fractures there's these like experience spits out these like flashes of being like oh what would the world be like if we weren't so like productivity pilled achievement pilled self-enhancement pilled when I think of this moment there's this moment that you and I shared once where we were in an outside of a nightclub and of this friend of ours was crying and just crying and crying and I just saw you sitting with this friend and I went and sat with you guys and we all a group of us just held this person crying not speaking in this way that I was like oh we probably wouldn't do this if we weren't all like sweaty and half dressed and many of us like pretty intoxicated and this person wouldn't be comfortable enough to just like cry in front of us while we were sober and like in clothes we could wear to work and like in a brightly lit room where like you know like there was this way that it was like a complete it was like a different use of public space and a different use of the social space of our friendships um and I think that is so that's like my um it's so inspiring to me it's so moving to me and I think it's there's really some really deep teaching about like the world we could be in that kind of like gets unlocked in those spaces especially when surprising things happen in them Thank you so much for being here with me today, Anna. Uh, I'm really honored, and it's uh, incredible to get a chance to talk to somebody who I think of as both a great friend and a great thinker. So thanks for being with us. Yeah, thanks so much for having me. It's really, really s sweet and connective, and also just, like, pleasurable to get to think and talk with you in this particular space. And I'm really honored that you invited me.